Welcome to Talk Dizzy to Me, the show that brings you a comprehensive look into the complex field of dizziness. Now here are your hosts, vestibular physical therapist, Dr. Abby Ross and Dr. Danielle Tolman. All right. Welcome back, everybody, to another episode of Talk Dizzy to Me. My name is Dr. Danielle Tolman. I am a vestibular physical therapist and, as always, joined by my co-host, Dr. Abby Ross, a vestibular physical therapist and neuroclinical specialist. And today we have a repeat co-host, uh, Jeff Walter, as well as our esteemed guest, Dr. Ian Kerthois. And we are very excited to have you here today to talk about some vibration in the vestibular system and sound and we are really, really pumped um, to kind of jump into this discussion. But if you wouldn't mind, would you uh, first start off by telling our listeners who you are, what your background is, some of the amazing contributions you've made to our vestibular community? Uh, well, I'm Ian Curthos. So I'm uh, Emeritus Professor of Vestibular Function at the University of Sydney, also a professor at Macquarie University in Sydney, Australia. And I've been researching in the vestibular system for 50 years. Uh, and about the last 15 years or so, I've spent a lot of effort on studying vibration uh, because vibration is a very effective way of stimulating um, the labyrinth and the inner ear, particularly the otoliths. But I'll as explain later, we'll, we'll go into that. But um, uh, I happen to think vibration is going to turn out to be a, a a simple, effective way of evaluating vestibular function that's still developing because a lot of the stuff you're going to hear has only been published really in about the last 15 years or so. Uh, and But people are realising more and more that it is such a uh, very useful and simple way of getting at the function of these structures in the inner ear. I emphasise function because um, that's the way you test vestibular operation. Imaging just is uh, not very useful in letting, giving you information about how the system is actually operating. What you want to know is how it's actually working rather than how it looks. So I focus much more on function than imaging. I'm acknowledging that imaging has come along a long way and I've uh, done some work in imaging as well, uh, as, as you will see. But uh, I what I want to get into is the question about the uh, interest so many people about why is it that these structures in the ear, in fact, are so sensitive to vibration uh, and uh, how can they be tested simply and effectively? So that's where I'm at. So, um... I just want to mention that Dr. Kerthois, like from my perspective, has made a huge contribution to our vestibular literature. He's um, written countless textbook chapters, many, many um, research studies. I've read um, his contributions over the years, and uh, I, it may be unparalleled. Um, so we're very fortunate to have him as a guest today. So you led into our first question is, why do you think the human ear is the vestibular system? Why do you think it is sensitive to vibration? I think you've got to really look at evolution because um, fish don't have cochleas, right? But fish are excellent at detecting vibrations and detecting the direction of vibrations. Mm -hmm. And as my... Old friend Hans Strucker said, once nature has solved a problem uh, in sensory physiology, it doesn't let it go. And I think a lot of the uh, aspects of vibration sensitivity stem all the way back to the sensitivity of fish for um, detecting vibrations for a predator, but also for sex. There are amazing studies where um, females, in fact, can uh, direct towards a male who's a male fish who's emitting particular vibrations. They're just little examples of of early uh, early operation of this system. But um, these days, people talk about the mammalian uh, labyrinth as evolving some of these specialised functions due to the fact that uh, once uh, 
species moved out of water into air, then their head movements became much more flexible and they had to evolve a much faster system for dealing with it in order to generate corrective responses very quickly. And that's the argument is that's why some of the uh, um, responses uh, have evolved from some of the structures in the inner ear, particularly these very sensitive type one receptors uh, in the otoliths and also in the canals, which are uh, the source of absolute fascination at the minute because they are um, just so remarkable. They, um, the, the synapse between the, the receptor and the primary afferent for a type one receptor and these afferents sending the signals to the brain is unique. It's incredibly fast. Um, and in fact, the recent studies have shown that it's, uh, it's unique in the nervous system in that it's essentially an electrical synapse dependent on the membrane potential. It's not the usual, you know, transmitter cascading across uh, from one cell to the next. That occurs, that does occur, but it's this particular synapse has got a very fast component called resistive coupling, which allows uh, uh, the signal from the receptor to couple to the primary afferent in, in the space of microseconds. The usual time for a, a, a signal across a synapse is about half a millisecond, okay? 500 microseconds. This, is, this transmission that I'm talking about, resistive coupling, occurs within about seven microseconds. So it is essentially electrical. And I think that is a key to so much of the uh, development of vibration sensitivity and these new methods that are coming about. It's a very special uh, system that's got to be super fast in order to generate signals that are going to go down the spine to generate corrective responses over to the eye muscles to generate corrective responses. But... Uh, that is pretty much the, the kind of my position about uh, sensitivity there. I've been recording from single nerve cells uh, connected or synapsing on those type one receptors in specialized parts of the striola, of the otoliths and uh, uh, studying exactly how they respond to vibration. And they are very sensitive. As I'm talking now, both of my outlets are getting stimulated. I've got absolutely no doubt about that. And you say, why is this not causing balance problems? I suspect in some people it does, right? But in many people it doesn't because firstly, it's stimulating both sides equally. And secondly, um, uh, there are mechanisms which uh, at the level of the vestibular nucleus, which suppress um, self-generated movements and uh, I think that suppression is also responsible for the fact that you're not getting, you're not kind of inundated by signals from this, this, this fast system. Um, but that is my position. But uh, because I've measured these uh, neurons and how sensitive they are. I want to make one point about, about the work that I've done uh, in this physiology and even the recent work, and that is that it has been conducted in guinea pigs. And many people say, what on earth? How can a guinea pig uh, physiology be relevant for human responses? To which I've got to say, well, almost all that's known about the cochlea has come from studying the cochlea of the guinea pig. Um, and I think the same is now applying for vestibular function. There have been studies of physiology of uh, canals and otoliths in monkeys to confirm how similar they are, monkeys and cats and also rats. So it's not some isolated result, just special to the guinea pig. There's species-wide um, uh, results which confirm what I've reported and what other people have reported in the guinea pig. But I emphasise the speed of this, how unusual it is, and the sensitivity of it. Do you, do you feel like... Um, which portions of the vestibular organ are sensitive to vibration? Do you think it's just primarily otolithic or otolithic and canal? Well, 
Um, if I go over to here, I, um, let me answer that by saying uh, the portions that are vibration sensitive are parts of the otoliths, in particular in healthy individuals. In healthy guinea pigs anyway, canals have got very poor response to vibration at high frequencies. They do have some response at very low frequencies, up to about 100 hertz, but they simply don't respond at high frequencies. Whereas uh, in uh, uh, the otoliths, those neurons can respond up to um, frequencies as high as thousands of hertz, thousands of hertz. In other words, audio frequencies. And that's from otoliths. The caveat is that in, in individuals with a... Uh, the hissence of the semicircular canal, the canals do respond to vibration. Uh, that opening of a canal allows the uh, hair cell deflections to be large enough to activate canal receptors. And I've shown that by making um, artificial dehiscences and demonstrating that these canal receptors, which were uh, insensitive to begin with, suddenly respond very vigorously to sound and vibration and then sealing it up again and showing that they revert back to insensitivity. So usually canal receptors don't respond to sound and vibration, except in this case when there's a thinning of the wall of the bony canal called an SCD. And that image on the screen shows you what I'm talking about at the minute, where there's an SCD and... Uh, <laughs> Uh, a thinning right here, so that as the stapes pumps in and out, it causes that uh, tube here to be reflected back and forth. And so it causes waves to travel down the tube in both directions. And of course, those waves are going to activate the semicircular canal receptors and generate uh, responses, uh, enhanced uh, BEMP responses, but also nystagmus in extreme cases, the Tulio phenomenon just by virtue of the fact that that, um, that SCD has caused this, allowed this uh, uh, canal to, in fact, have a fluid flow within the duct to deflect the cupula. So my general answer to your question is, usually it's just the otoliths, and in particular, just a particular part of the otoliths called the striola, where these type 1 receptors are densely uh, densely populated, uh, much of the much of the otoliths do not respond to vibration at all. But the cells in this very, this band, this curved band around the, uh, the surface of the um, otoliths are very sensitive to vibrations, uh, both for the utricle and also the saccule. That was my question. Is there a optimized the responsiveness, is it optimized at a particular frequency for the otoliths? Like where does it maximize the response? That's, uh, the response at a 500 hertz for the otoliths is very strong. Okay. Um, it does roll off at higher frequencies, but it's still present up to, as I said, 3000 hertz. But part of that is going to be due to the transmission of uh, information through the bone, um, but it's also good down to very low frequencies. But um, um, the, uh, on the other hand, the canals, they, they respond best to low frequencies. There's a phenomenon called vibration-induced nystagmus, where if someone has got a unilateral loss and you apply a, a vibrator onto the mastoid, you generate this nystagmus. It's a very simple test. It's a bedside test. Uh, and it, it is due to the fact that the canals are responding to vibration. But what people didn't realize, initially they used uh, 30 hertz in order to cause this particular response. In fact, 100 hertz is optimum and higher frequencies, it just rolls right off. But uh, the loss of one side can be detected very simply in this test called vibration-induced nystagmus. And it happens because that vibration activates the canals on both sides of the head, 
on both sides and they cancel out. But of course, if you've got one side lost, they don't cancel. So one side, in fact, wins and generates a nystagmus. My colleague, Georges Dumas in France, has been studying this for many years and people are now realising that this can be a very useful uh, clinical test, a bedside test even, for patients, even many years after they've had that uh, unilateral loss. It's not like some of the other phenomena which recover quickly. So, but in terms of the best frequency in answer to your question, um, I can't really put a, a figure on that because uh, uh, apart from saying about 500 hertz in my experience in the guinea pig is just about optimum for the otoliths. For our listeners at home, I just want to back up really quick about your um, skull-induced nystagmus testing, that bedside test. Could you just briefly describe, um, from a clinician's point of view, what they'll see in a normal, um, uh, normally functioning patient versus somebody with a hypofunction when they um, place vibration over a massoid on, on each of those examples? Well, the important thing is to have a vibrator that goes on the mastoid, not on the neck muscle, on the mastoid, particularly on that bony protuberance just behind the ear and a little bit above that. Mm -hmm. uh, it's got to be a uh, 100 hertz vibrator, so something like a body massager, so long as it's high enough frequency. Many uh, body massagers, in fact, uh, only go to 30 hertz, so it's a very ineffective stimulus. Uh, the important thing about that clinical test is it's important to eliminate fixation because fixation suppresses nystagmus. So you need to have a way of being able to visualise someone's eyes uh, while they, uh, they have vision denied. Um, and that can be done in various ways. But what you see when you apply this vibration are the quick phases of nystagmus. You, the quick phases are quite clear. You never see slow phases. You see quick phases beating away from the affected ear. And it doesn't matter which side you're testing, right? If someone's had a unilateral loss, because the information is transmitted across the skull, right? So you can test, put the vibrator on the left ear or the right ear, and you get the same direction of nystagmus in someone who's got a unilateral loss. It's being transmitted. It's causing those uh, receptors in the semicircular canals to be <clears throat> activated and that is generating the nystagmus and what you're seeing are the little quick phases which are so obvious. Uh, I think people, you probably can modify iPhones now to do tests like that uh, without too much trouble but the important thing is to get the frequency right, don't use low frequencies and eliminate fixation. Uh, Fresnel glasses are one way of doing that, uh, but uh, I think it is worth uh, using because uh, there's so few simple tests available to clinicians to get a handle on what might be wrong with their patients. And this is one very simple test which gives you a handle. Are you saying the response, the eye movement, the actual nystagmus is canal origin or do you think the eye movement is otolithic origin it's it, it's probably it's probably both um because we know the otoliths are going to be responding at 100 hertz and we know that otoliths and canal neurons uh, converge uh, at the level of the vestibular nucleus and they project up to eye muscles i suspect it's the canal contribution is major but that stimulus is going to be generating, stimulating both the canals and the otoliths. The main thing is it's there. And I mean, it's an indicator. This is not a test of otolith function in unilaterals. It's a test of whether someone has a unilateral vestibular loss. So in a normal subject, you'd expect no responsiveness or could you get like... I'm talking about not long duration stimulation. I'm talking about stimuli, stimulation lasting about 10 seconds, something like that. A normal subject, you might get one or two little beats uh, of, nis, of mistakes, quick phases. In someone with a unilateral loss, you'll get substantially more. It gets up to not a terrifically high slow phase velocity, about 10 degrees a second but or above, 
but uh, it's just so clear. That's the point. It's not not some subtle little thing. I mean, you see these quick phases uh, so so very clearly. It's quite dramatic when you see it. And for people who are who are you know dubious about it, it's worth testing someone with a known unilateral loss yeah. to verify. But like a schwannoma resection. Yeah. Their healthy, healthy people have got very small responses. We know that from vibration alone. Uh, in fact, if you, in a healthy person, if you stimulate the mastoid uh, or or even the, the midline of the skull with vibration of 500 hertz and measure the eye movements, you find tiny little eye movement responses. And by tiny, I mean a tenth of a degree. Uh, some of that order in response to that vibration. Um, I have a slide of that in here. And you would think that's yeah. this, this shows you the results of testing a single a healthy person with vibration. The vibrations applied right here, and you can see the eye movement response. This is a horizontal, vertical, and torsional eye movement responses in a healthy person and every line is a separate test so you can see how systematic it is but um what's not clear in there because it's obscured you can see the scale there is half a degree which is minute right and that that was with a fairly uh, vigorous response now in my book that is an oatleth response because uh 500 hertz is a lousy stimulus for semicircular canal right and that that makes a lot of sense because in fact you know, there are pathways from the outlets up to the eye muscles, and that's the basis for the OVEMP response, the, that the response that you can measure with electrodes beneath the eyes in response to vibration, bone-conducted vibration or air-conducted sound. And this is just showing that if you're careful with the measurements, you can, in fact, detect very small eye movement responses to that stimulus uh, itself. So in summary for the listeners, you want to use um, a vibratory stimuli that's 100 hertz, and you're looking for nystagmus that's driven in one direction, no matter what side of the, no matter which mastoid you vibrates, we're looking for a nystagmus that's in the same direction with left versus right mastoid vibration, and it's a reliable, long-lasting sign of vestibular hypofunction. Right. Um, and what, what you see are the little quick phases. They're very easily detectable. And we but you must remove vision. You must exclude vision because if there's any visual stimuli, that will suppress the nystagmus. Do you feel like it has clinical utility for the identification of superior canal dehiscence in subjects? Superior canal dehiscence is very interesting because if you do that test, you know, we've been talking so far about unilateral loss. I mean, complete loss of one labyrinth. But what Dumas has done is test a whole lot of patients with um, semicircular canal dehiscence and demonstrated uh, uh, what you get in those patients here is that if there's a dehiscence, it generates these waves in the semicircular canals, which cause a strong nystagmus. But the, the difference with, with SCD is that this works up to high frequencies, right? You can get that nystagmus, you can get responses here up to five or 700 hertz, right? Which you just don't get in, in uh, uh, other situations. But the, the area of uh, nystagmus in SCDs has been very puzzling because um, vibration induced nystagmus in SCDs. And you can see why, because What's going to happen is that it sets up waves which travel in both directions. This is work of um, Rick Rabbit and Martha Iverson, who, in fact, demonstrated these waves in toadfish. But depending where that SCD is, you can see those waves are going to cancel out before they actually get to the receptors in the, in, at the ampulla. Or there's... One side is going to win, so you're going to get nystagmus in one direction, or the other side's going to win. If the SCD is over here, it's going to get to that uh, crystal earlier. Uh, earlier. 
So I think this explains uh, largely uh, the um, variability that there is in responses in SCD because it's been very confusing. The direction of nystagmus is not a good indicator of, of um, it can't take the direction of SCD uh, uh, as being of crucial importance, the direction of nystagmus in SCD as being of crucial importance in this. The importance is the presence of the nystagmus at high frequencies. 500 hertz is an excellent way of um, testing out this stimulus. One of the points that uh, I know you're interested in, in clinical tests for SCD, SCD is not a common condition. It is, as, as you're all aware, very unusual. But if you wanted a kind of a bedside test, I suspect you could probably measure the eye movement response using something like a, an iPhone uh, in movie mode, but making sure that you eliminate um, uh, visual fixation. So put a pair of headphones on the person, put the iPhone, you know, close to the eye and eliminate vision in the other eye and uh, have a look at what nystagmus occurs, uh, making sure you're using a you know, high enough frequency like 500 hertz, uh, four or 500 hertz, uh, but not being fooled by the direction for the reasons that I've just given. The direction, I think, depends very extensively on the location of that of that dehiscence. I, I've read that it's a, with SCD that we have we should apply the vibration of the vertex of the skull. Do you feel that that's yes? Vibration of the vertex is a very with SCDs is a very good way of identifying it as well. Yep, you're right. And where does the clinician find a tool that will vibrate a head at 500 hertz? <laughs> Well, um, it's got to be a fairly strong stimulus. We've used a commercial uh, vibrator called a mini shaker, which is a large device. Uh, and the reason we do it is that it's powerful and it's uh, you can vary the frequency. But I suspect there are variations of that that are available. Um, and also, I also think that body massages probably could do the job as well if they've got a high enough frequency. But I haven't looked into that, so I can't answer that. I point. haven't. I haven't found a massager that goes that high. Yeah, but it's got to be a strong enough stimulus as well. And I, when you ask me about how strong it is, I can't give you a numerical answer on that. Okay. Now, how? I mean, from a clinician point of view, how comfortable is that for the patient? Um, I know doing the bedside clinical test with 100 hertz seems to be a little bit of a, of a stretch sometimes to convince people to um, withstand that for, you know, prolonged periods of time. But, you know, 500 hertz seems like it might be a little bit more uncomfortable. Is, is that so or not so much? Uh, the patients don't like it, but, but the simple fact is it's, I'm talking about 10 seconds of stimulation, right? It's 500 hertz over a very short time. You don't need to keep this thing going for minutes or hours. It's over a very short time period. I think uh, have a George Dumas has written a, a number of papers and he's got some recent ones out on SCD and I think they're the place to, to have a look. But um, patients, of course, will experience uh, sensations, vestibular sensations during this and they're frequently kind of, they're not particularly pleasant, but it's over so quickly. Now, are there any contraindications to using something like this with patients? Any comorbidities we should be looking for to indicate us not to use this type of test? I can't answer that. I'm a scientist and I simply, uh, I don't know the answer. That I know that George Dumas in France has uh, tested about 17,000 patients over 20 years with this test. And uh, I don't believe he's had any adverse you know, contraindications in that number of patients. From my experience, and again, this really isn't published, but I hesitate to do it if a patient's had recent skull fracture, recent ear surgery, retinal detachment, but I don't know how I feel about that. Um, yes, I think they're, all, they're very good points, yes. 
you got to make sure. I mean, do no harm. That's the important thing. Yeah. Um, the other th thought would be if a patient's on blood thinners, but I don't know. What about somebody who frequently has recurrences of BPPV? Is there any concern yeah. about vibrating the skull with that? I've been concerned about it, but I don't know. So she's thinking, Dr. Kurthoy, she's concerned. Does it detach otoconia potentially? Well, believe it or not, my, my old mentor, Charlie Markham, thought vibration was a very good way of, in fact, removing some of those displaced otoconia in the canal, actually kind of vibrating them so that they're going to shift along the canal, in along the duct, and yeah. get into, into the utricular space. Uh, it may almost have therapeutic value. But I guess the thought is, is, are you detaching some of them? Are you detaching some of the ones that are still adherent where they belong in the odorless? In the, you know, that, that is a concern. Yes, that yeah. is a concern. I think these are things we don't know answers to. <laughs> it's hard to say. Since you brought up the, the concept of a therapeutic value, is there any therapeutic value to introducing vibration um, to a patient suffering from vestibular dysfunction to help with motion sickness or curtail, you know, vertigo-like symptoms with low frequency vibration? Uh, I don't, I don't know of any systematic study of that, but um, the, there is one area which is suggestive and that is if you think about a lot of those patients, one of their problems is they don't have good otolithic information about, about uh, direction, about gravity, where gravity is. So they have that postural unsteadiness. Uh, and in fact, the group in Spain, uh, Angel Ramos and others, in fact, have uh, implanted electrodes in the saccule stimulating the saccular nerve of these patients with bilateral vestibular loss and simply generated a continuous uh, stream of pulses, not bearing it at all. And the performance of these patients with this stream, which I think is a, serving as an anchor, uh, their performance on gait and postural tests uh, significantly improves. Uh, if you follow that through, you think, well, you, it wouldn't make sense to have a continuous vibration signal in some of these patients. It may well serve as an anchor uh, for their, for them. But I don't know of any studies that have been published that have uh, used that procedure. But these days, it's simple enough to get bone conducted headphones, for example. So it would be quite feasible to do that experiment having a, a continuous uh, signal provided by those headphones about uh, which is activating the, the, the otolus and providing, possibly providing the signal about direction, which is missing in some of those patients. I think that's a study for the future. I think it's so cool that we still have so much to look into and so much to research. It makes this uh, field of study just so exciting and something to constantly be looking forward to um, looking into the future. So uh, this is just all, this is all really great stuff. <laughs> so you had mentioned earlier, you recommend applying vibration over the mastoid area yes. of the ear and not the SCM muscle because I've seen others advocate doing it over the uh, SCM muscle. Well, I'm interested in stimulating the, uh, the labyrinth and applying it to the SCM muscle, I think gives a kind of a mixed stimulus because some of that vibration will activate canals, but some of it will activate muscle receptors. And we know that muscle receptors, in fact, project up to the vestibular nucleus as well. So I've been focused on something that's a bit more selective than SCM and mastoid stimulation is it. Gotcha. I think that answer a lot. So on, on Can, question about excitement and whatever. Um, I'm very excited about this these new this new paper that we've just had published, following on the work of Donatella Contini, demonstrating this very very fast electrical transmission from these receptors in the outlets over to the afferent neurons. Um, 
that is a, that really is a breakthrough in synaptic physiology, let alone vestibular understanding. Mm -hmm. That this this transmission uh, is so unusual, and uh, as I say, it's probably evolved to um, allow these very fast signals to be transmitted so quickly to generate corrective movements. We, in that paper, we, we were contrasting, you know, many people think, oh, well, the cochlear and vestibular functions are so similar, the receptors look the same. In that paper that's just been published about a week ago, um, we've demonstrated that they're not. Those receptors are totally different in the cochlear versus the vestibular system in so many ways. We've looked at these elicited uh, responses which can be blocked so that transmitter the transmitter, both in the cochlear and the vestibular system, is exactly the same. It's called glutamate. But if you block glutamate, it wipes out cochlear responses. It does absolutely nothing for vestibular responses. That is extremely dramatic, and that is showing that there's some completely different method of transmitting information in the vestibular system compared to the cochlear. And finally, I point out, in fact, the vestibular system is faster than the cochlear faster uh, it, by looking at the latency of the onset of the response vestibular function is uh, shows earlier responses than it than cochlear function does people always think the cochlear function is the supreme example of high speed responses in fact vestibular function predates in evolutionary terms the cochlear and also if you think about it it's got to be super fast to allow things like uh, that responses for fish underwater in order for them to detect the direction of different vibrations to escape predators. Right. Do you think, um, what effect do you think age has on this vibratory ref reflex? Do you think there is much of a decline? That's hard to answer because, you know, the usual responses that are measured in uh in senior citizens like me <laughs> are confounded because you've got the loss of receptors which anatomy shows is clearly happening but you've also got reduced muscle loss as well so the changes that are measured could be due to either one of those we do know that you know many vestibular functions are preserved fantastically well uh, in senior people we've demonstrated the head impulse response in some very senior citizens uh, is as good as it is in, in uh, youngsters who are only 20 years old. We had one patient who was 92 whose, whose uh, grandson brought her in and they tested both of them. And the, the lady who was 92 had better head impulse responses than the youngster who was in his 20s. <laughs> so- I guess that proves that age is just a number. I think I, I like that idea. <laughs> <laughs> I, I wanted like to ask, too. I wanted to ask you, and you just alluded to it a little bit. You've been involved in so much research over your career thus far. Are there any studies that you've been involved with that jump out to you as really significant in changing the course of vestibular evaluation or function? Oh, I've got to answer the head impulse test. Is it? because we, we discovered that back in 1984 in the clinical version, you know, there's a sudden abrupt passive head turn and looking at the corrective eye movement response. And that is carried out in, uh, in bedside testing around the world. But the proper way of doing it is using proper measures of eye movement responses. And that's just so common now around the world. We published that in 84 and, and 90 and then um, Hamish McDougall came up with a video version of that which has now demonstrated to measure the response of uh, all six canals including the vertical canal some of the systems on the market do not measure vertical canals properly because the assumptions in the engineering approach that they have adopted are simply untenable the the system that we developed which was uh, followed on by Odometrics, does measure vertical canal responses extremely well and accurately. And I published a paper earlier this year 
uh, demonstrating why some of those assumptions in other methods simply are unacceptable. But to be able to measure all six canals uh, is, you know, something <laughs> which, <laughs> if you look back on it uh, for about a century, people were lucky to measure two with the calorics, and now you can get all six. And that is just, it's just opened up so many new ways of thinking about vestibular function, about isolated canal loss, about bilateral loss of vestibular function, all kinds of things. But don't get me carried away. Yes, I'm very proud of that one. <laughs> uh, one more question with vibration that I had is occasionally when I apply mastoid vibration, and it isn't frequent, but I see vertical eye movement responses and I kind of scratch my head and there are patients that don't really have a case, they don't have a case history suggestive of SCD. Any idea why some subjects would have vertically driven the stagnus with vibration? I mean, well, I think that comes down to pathology. Uh, I'm also not sure whereabouts you were stimulating. Was it on the mastoid? Mastoid, yeah. Uh, 100 hertz. Uh, well, that, um, in, in the case of um, the vertical canal responses are unusual because vibration, if it's going to activate uh, vertical canals, is usually will activate both vertical canals in the labyrinth. So their directions of response will cancel. Right. But what, will, what will be present will be torsion because the torsion will be in the same direction for both canals. Well, I wrote a paper uh, a couple of years ago about the neural basis of vibration induced nystagmus, and I went through this based on the evidence from Bernie Cohen in New York years ago where they stimulated individual canals in monkeys and looked at the <clears throat> direction of the eye movement response. But um, the, it, there's no doubt that that, uh, that stimulus is also going to be activating otolus. And... Uh, the Oculus role in generating eye movements is um, is present. I've shown you the evidence for that, but it's also kind of uh, still got to be worked out. It really does. There's some old work um, of localized stimulation of parts of the Oculus um, by Sentagatai, who looked at the direction of eye movements by localized physics physical stimulation of particular parts of the otolus alone and the direction of the eye movement response that occurred. But but that was back, back in about 1965, and very few people have, have done anything similar to that since. Um, it's an area that uh, is waiting to be understood, frankly. That's the best I can say about yeah. explaining vertical eye movements in in unusual patients, I would, I would pursue that further with other tests if I were you. Yeah. Well, speaking about the future and and where you're kind of just starting to dive off now from your recent publication, you know, what does your recent findings? Where does that kind of push us into? What is that alluding to moving forward in the research of um, finding out that these um, reactions are much faster than uh, cochlear reactions. Like, what is that now indicating, and where is that kind of pushing us into to start looking into and discovering? Well, one of the big confounding factors in in most of the studies of vibration and sound has been the fact that you're always stimulating the cochlea. So the question is, is this really vestibular? Or is this cochlear? And now, you know, that demonstration at uh, of the difference between vestibular and cochlear. Uh, receptors and afferents uh, is kind of given us a lever of separating those two. And one way of s isolating those vestibular responses is by using masking noise. Masking is a very effective way of eliminating cochlear function, but it has just very little effect on vestibular function. And I think uh, the future may well head towards using masking noise as a way of uh, selectively or giving selective information about vestibular operation rather than cochlear. And I also, you know, suggest if you've got any doubt in your patients about whether the response has got 
is due to any cochlear function, uh, put on a depression, put them on a pair of headphones and play uh, masking noise to eliminate it. I, I caution, however, that throughout my whole career, I have avoided using air-conducted sound stimulation for testing vestibular function. Because in order to do that, you've got to present very high intensities and they are potentially dangerous. Mm -hmm. And in fact, there have been reports of, it's been one report of someone who suffered a permanent hearing loss due to vestibular, inappropriate vestibular testing. Bone conduction vibration is a much better way of testing vestibular function because the intensities are low and it avoids that conductive hearing loss that so many patients have, both senior patients and also kids with, you know, glue ear and whatever, where air-conducted sound is completely ineffective. Well, Dr. Kerthois, we cannot thank you enough, not only for coming on Talk Dizzy to me, what an honor, but also for all your contributions to the vestibular world. I think any clinicians listening to this, the next time they do a head impulse or any sort of vibration, they're going to thank you, which is amazing. Thank you so much. Well, I've got to, I've got to please make sure they don't just thank me. It's, it's Kerthois and Hal Margie or Hal Margie and Kerthois was the two of us working together the clinician and the scientist that came up with that test. And we've done so much work since I, literally over the last 50 years. Well, we thank you. And we'll be sure to link those studies um, in the show notes, as well as your recent publication, if anybody wants to um, get their hands on that or read the abstract. And again, thank you so much. We were so thrilled you were able to join us today. And we look forward to getting this episode out for everyone else to hear. So thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kerthos. Cheerio. This podcast is provided for informational purposes only and is not intended as a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Always seek the advice of your physician or other qualified health provider with any questions you may have regarding a medical condition. The content of this podcast is based on general knowledge and information available up until January 2024. Medical knowledge and practices may evolve over time and new information may emerge that could change the understanding or treatment of vestibular dysfunction. It is important to consult a qualified healthcare professional for the most up-to-date and personalized advice. The information provided in this podcast is meant to complement, not replace the relationship that exists between a patient and their healthcare provider. It is intended to power patients with the knowledge about vestibular dysfunction and its management, but individual cases may vary and treatment approaches should be tailored to each patient's unique circumstances. By listening to this podcast, you acknowledge and agree to the terms of this medical disclaimer. The organizers, presenters, and creators of this podcast are not liable for any actions or decisions taken by individuals based on the information presented herein. Always consult with a qualified healthcare provider for medical advice and treatment.